it, so I'm not going to. Okay, so this is uh, in the spirit of uh, planning to fail and iterating and trying something new all the time, which is a personal philosophy of mine. We're trying this uh, new format this year with a student panel. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I get to meet with most of these students uh, a couple times a month, and it's pretty much like the most rewarding part of that week for me. So uh, I'm hoping a similar type experience happens for you in hearing what they have to say about uh, how they use technology in their learning and outside of their learning. And um, uh, I'm super psyched to get uh, Mr. Ben Minette uh, as our moderator today. This, this marks Mr. Minette's 100th panel moderation. So congratulations to Ben. He gets an extra pin. And uh, I'm just going to hand it over to them. So enjoy. I want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Mic's on. We're all good. Uh, Mr. Stengel overestimated my panel moderation, I think by moving a decimal point two places, but we're willing to make uh, a couple allowances for failure. Kids, I want to talk to you first. What ordinarily happens on a day like today, and I'll let you know, is that about half of the audience listens to, listens to technology and make sure that we sort of push technology, and half of us say, nope. Uh, there's a certain skepticism that this is really going to hurt my practice, that some of this stuff is great now, but in, the, in a year from now it's going to be something new. Another half of us say, this is awesome, I can't wait to get in front of the computer, I want to make this work. That half is usually decided on a guess on what's going to be best for you guys. Um, what actually helps you learn in the classroom, what brings you, as you heard in the presentation, from point A to point B. Point A being, I'm not sure about this content in this particular class. Point B being, I think I get it. I'm, I'm interested in this. I understand it. And so it's really valuable, maybe the most valuable thing that will happen all day, to actually hear. So it's not just guesswork, what goes into whether we involve more technology or not, but what really happens in your brains. To start us off then, I think at least your names and maybe something about you would be a, a good way to start. We just want to go around starting with, oh, I guess. All right, Jimmy, why don't we start with you? You've been nominated by Matt. So what's your name, Jimmy? Um, I am Jimmy Routh. And um, one thing about me, I am, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm Jimmy Routh, and I am drum captain of the high school drum line. So there's one thing about me. My name is Eleni Nicholas, and um, I run track. There you go. Oh, and I'm also secretary of the student council. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm Sarah Niederberger. Uh, I'm a treasurer on student council. I play the banjo and I play volleyball. <laughs> um, I'm Claire Doherty. I'm a co-vice president, and I run track and cross country and can ride the unicycle. Um, I'm Hugh McMahon. I'm a um, co-president, and um, I'm in the choir. And I do the musical. Hi, I'm Laura Weston. I'm a co-treasurer of the Student Council, and I'm also a cheerleader. Hey, I'm Maddie Rice. I'm one of the co-VPs, and I am an ETC and a student journalist. Thank you, of course, to all of us. I think maybe uh, one of the best places to begin is to follow up on the presentation you guys heard uh, just this morning. And to keep it open for your guys' thoughts, what in that presentation you heard this morning, lots of different ideas in there, what either most resonated with you, now has inspired you, or as you imagine, because all of you have a leadership role to play in our school, for your peers, what did you hear in there that could really resonate, could really yeah. you know, make our school better? I think the idea of um, bringing students into a position where they're encouraged to create and learn and use the ideas they've gathered to generate actual products that show the learning, because it feels sometimes in our classes that we're just sitting down and absorbing information and then trying to spit it back out for a test, but really trying to interpret it and make something of it is the most effective way to learn, I guess. Yeah, I really like the, the 20 thing. I don't know what it was exactly called, but um, yeah, the 20% of taking the stuff that you're learning. And you always talk about using like real world examples and how that connects it to the world and that makes it you know, supposed to feel more worthwhile, but actually putting it into doing a project and actually making a change or I don't know, really physicalizing it would be really, really cool. If I understand what you're talking about, that moment Google modeled this where 20% of your time is spent on a project that you would like to do. Um, to be real for a second, though, how many kids are going to take advantage of that? If we say every Friday, you do what you want. 
would we have a student body that decides, finally, some free time, I can finally do the thing that I want, or do we have maybe this idea where people are just going to have an opportunity to slack off more? What do we think about that? Right. Oh, well, I was, um, I was surprised at my reaction to that, especially when she started um, with uh, the fact that they presented their projects in like a conference, which I think is a great idea to motivate everyone to be a part of that. But instead of being excited right away, I just had like that twinge in my gut, like, oh, it's one more thing to do. And I think that's why we need and would use that free time, because um, with all the, the homework and for us college applications, there isn't room in our lives for creativity. And that's a really kind of disappointing thing, that we don't have that opportunity to exercise that part of ourselves. And I think, I don't know, I think there is enough creativity in each person that we're not using to fill that time. And sorry, one more thing. OK. I think that if we maybe developed or like helped to have prosper a culture of like anything is possible by really encouraging these moonshots. 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 <laughs> I think that uh, people, will be more, people will be more willing to do it because uh, I think in, I don't know, a lot of times as students we feel like, oh, there are like so many things that need to be done in the world, but we're just students, we're just learning, we're getting like the stuff that we need so we can do it later. But I think the idea of having the ability to do it now and if teachers really encourage that, students would be so much more willing to push the boundaries and try something um, in their free time. Any other thoughts about that? So you're really suggesting it's a, a cultural shift. Maybe immediately it would be uh, worrisome or it would be a chance to slack off, but over the course of several years, teachers sort of start and that inspiration could work out that way. Um, a similar question to follow up from, from our points of view. Uh, how much would you allow us to take risks in the classroom? I feel like it's one of my sacred duties to be a professional in the classroom, to present to you things that are tried and true and work, and my links for a PowerPoint work and things like that. But I'm sure there's several of my colleagues who hear the idea that you guys could be guinea pigs in one class, and then I'll, maybe I'll fix it in a couple years. But that's a real risk, a risk that I don't, I'm not sure if I want to take. So my question is, how much do you respect or lose respect for a teacher who tries these things out technologically but maybe fails? I respect teachers that take risks a lot because it's not that engaging just to sit in class and hear a teacher lecture all the time. It's whenever you try new things and try to learn new ways, like on Google communities even. Um, we did this with volleyball. We talked about ways that we'll improve ourselves. We had it written down online. And it was just really helpful. It's a different perspective. And I think that helps students grow and learn a lot more. And it sounds weird to say it this way, but it's almost kind of like humanizing. Like we won't be confident to take those risks unless we can see teachers taking risks. And I mean, anyone who's ever, like this has happened in all of our classes where a PowerPoint goes down and we're not like mad at the teacher or mad at the PowerPoint. We're like, oh, it's happened to all of us a thousand times and we just move on. Um, and would you suggest your feeling, and let's be honest, we have a cross section of not all of the students, but our very best you think all the students feel the same way, or is there a chance that if a teacher's PowerPoint does go down, most students say, ha ha, you suck? <laughs> I think the very, very, very worst case scenario would be a student going, oh great, five more minutes, I don't have class. Like, that's the worst reaction you could possibly get. But unlikely, you're suggesting? So it's worth it to take the risks? Right, I definitely think, yeah, yeah, the worst case scenario is someone's like, I don't really care either way. <laughs> if we never took the risk at all, we'd still be using those overhead projector things. You use little wet erase markers on. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> those are horrible. <laughs> the <little> red smear. <laughs> yeah. uh, be careful. Uh, those overhead projectors are still in use, and some people right now are saying, well, what does that girl know about it? <laughs> let, me let me move on here a little bit. We've talked a lot about technology in the classroom, the chance for this, but can we tap into your lives a little bit? Clearly now you're in a setting that you're comfortable with. Maybe this resembles your furniture at home or this lamp was taken out of your house or maybe you also have this picture and fireplace. But outside of, the, uh, outside of class, we know that you use technology. We know that you use it a lot. Is there anything you can think of that could be taken from outside of the class and brought into our class? Loud noises, for example. Social media kind of things, uh, an app that you know is awesome, you spend so much time. If we could just find a way to tap into that and put it in our classroom, the engagement is so much easier. 
I believe in you, Eleni. Take a okay. risk. Well, I would say a lot of us are on Snapchat, which is kind of, okay, sorry. Um, I would say a lot of us are on Snapchat, and that sounds kind of weird because it might be like just taking pictures, but they have a lot of stuff from like CNN, National Geographic, People, um, like they can like give information that way. They're like connected with Snapchat, so it's sort of like another Twitter where they're getting information out, and it's blocked, and I think it shouldn't be blocked, first of all, because you can, it's something really quick, because I'm on it like all day, so if I just like swipe real quick, like check the news or something. I'm getting a lot of information, although it doesn't seem like something that would be useful. That yeah, and sense. even like not every student checks their email, which I know is a systemic issue, but if you just got like a Snapchat and could open it for 10 seconds and see, oh, that test was moved back a day, that'd be really useful. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you could get a Snapchat from a teacher, that'd be crazy. <laughs> Because it would show us a notification right away, and it'd be like, oh, cool. Not like pictures. That'd be weird. But like, yeah, if it said like... It's like a picture of paper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that would be cool. Um, something that you should be aware of, and I can, I can feel this for myself, and I'm sure it must be true of other people, is we don't exactly know what you're always talking about whenever it comes to these things by their names. Uh, so for those of us who don't know what a Snapchat is, because we still think face, my fate, face, my space is, is it, what, what is Snapchat again? Snapchat is an app on our phones. We all basically all have it on our phones. And you are friends with people in Snapchat, usually your contacts, like people in your phone. And you send pictures to each other. But what? Or videos. Or, or videos that disappear after you send them. So they'll see it, and it'll disappear, and they can't see it again. And it's kind of like the new medium of communication. And they're usually funny. And, yeah. Or you can screenshot the picture if you want. Saucy things happen when that happens, but... And again, to use this in an uh, educational setting, the suggestion is we would announce, quiz move back, you would see this, and then it would instantly disappear. Right, after, so you can, set them, you can set them for between 2 and 10 seconds. So, and you can also, there's a way you can add it to a timeline, so there would be a running list of all the photos that you've sent in the last 24 hours. So it would be just... You know, because a student's probably going to delete that email and not look at it again after they open it. So it's about the same exposure to the information that we would get anyway, but in a quicker, easier method. Would I have to take a picture of the quiz that would be moved then later? No. Well, you can add text to the images. Oh, so if you took a picture of the classroom or you could write on a sheet of paper and take a picture of that, the message you want, it's just a, it's through the medium of pictures, but it's just a quick way to deliver information. There's also something called Snapchat Stories. So oh. you can post... Um, like uh, we can all post a picture. Not instead of sending it to people, we can send it to our story, and that story is visible for 24 hours. So if a teacher were to post to a story, we could all check the stories, and they could you could repeatedly see it throughout that 24-hour period. Yeah. Oh, you can also see who sees the story. That's true. So a yeah. teacher could see how many of their students actually saw the information that they posted there. And I imagine you guys use this to tell some ridiculous story of your trip to Chipotle or something. But potentially, we could Always. use this. Here's the things you may have missed in class. We could even designate a student to say, can you take a picture and say, here's an important moment, here's an important moment, here's an important moment. That could become a story that gets sent out there. And I could make sure that people would see that. Is, is That's really true? cool. <laughs> um, any other suggestions? What else is out there that we are unaware of? Or, or, or some of the younger folks may be aware of. Or the older folks, too, who are more plugged in than I am. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, thought, I think we've been doing a really good job of implementing like Twitter accounts, like for different sports teams, or like I think of Link Crew, um, in a ways of like communicating the different announcements that are going on, like the current activities. I think that's a really efficient way. I also think of like the sports account. It's a really efficient way to distribute all sorts of information about what's going on with this program or like this activity. Um, it's really efficient in getting the information out to the student body, I think. So I think we've done a good job with that. Yeah, also with Twitter, you can set on not like set up notifications on your phone. So like if a specific account like tweets something, it'll pop up like on your home screen. So like if a teacher say like I don't know, what if like I don't know what I'm trying to say. But if a teacher did tweet something out, I would easily be able to see like, "Oh, I have homework. Couldn't forget that, you know? <laughs> Can't lose those 10 points, you know?" <laughs> um so while we're talking about things that are outside the classroom and that we could potentially bring in, can we switch gears to things that have been brought in? Um, 
I'm sure in the four years that you've been in the high school and more years before that in the other schools, you've seen interesting uses of technology that potentially even made learning possible that wouldn't be possible without that type of learning. Can you give any of those examples of where it really worked for you? Oh, I mean the end drive to the Google Drive. <laughs> Two different worlds. The end drive was horrible. And uh, the W drive too, yeah. Still being used, I do not encourage the W drive for those few people who still use it. Yeah, but the freedom to just like make a document and then share it with your teacher, and they can see when you share it, and they can make their edits, and everyone can collaborate on it. It's really cool and helpful, and you can do it from anywhere. You can do it in the school from your you know phone. Oh wait. Okay, well, students can collaborate with students on Google Drive, which is really helpful just because projects, it's hard to get together with, because we have so many activities and everything. Finding a time where we can all meet at the gallery is very difficult. Um, so being able to work together is useful. Um, and another way that I've seen technology being used by teachers is Mr. Boovy. I don't know if he's here today, but he, for math class, he posts videos of himself doing basically every problem ever you could ever think of and he posts them on his website so if you go home and you're confused about a problem you can access it right away it's super easy um, super informative that's probably the best use of technology I've seen any other thoughts about what great uses of technology you've seen that maybe could be a model for other teachers um, one thing I can think of is for people who are more like visual learners. Like I think of um, in organic chemistry, what we're doing is we pull up like a website on the computer and we'd be able to look at the different like 3D orientation or <clears throat> like the movement of molecules. You can kind of like, you know, rotate and like zoom in and zoom out and get different perspectives from the molecules. So for something like science related and if you're more of a visual learner, there are many different ways you can implement like technology as I've seen. It's like very, I think it's very useful. Any other thoughts? Um, no, let's we'll make this a little bit more controversial maybe to a little bit of a discussion here because I'm also trying to speak for colleagues who see technology as sometimes a little bit of a threat. What I'm thinking about is the idea that if technology becomes so um, predominant in the classroom, is there even room for a teacher left? You have things like online lessons, you have YouTube instructional videos, you have virtual field trips that we saw. We know that Mr. Boovey should be applauded for putting lots of his lessons online, but all of a sudden is real Mr. Boovey even useful anymore because we have him in a virtual form and all lessons can be accomplished by you sitting watching the screen. So do you see a role for a teacher in the future of education? Do you still need someone like me? Um, yeah, I think there's definitely um, <clears throat> a need for a teacher because people learn all sorts of different ways. Like some person isn't just going to understand a topic just by like watching a YouTube presentation on it. I think it's still very important for the teacher to be there to like, like you know, lecture, just like explain the lesson, what's going on, so everyone can understand because there might be, you know, there are all sorts of different learners and someone might not be able to like grasp the concept right away just by watching, you know, like a YouTube presentation or all the different types of like technological like opportunities that are available. I think if anything, technology opens the door to the teacher's role being furthered because we, I don't think the teacher's job is necessarily to communicate information that we could read in a book or we could see on a YouTube channel, but to connect the ideas and ask why it matters and what we can do with it and really encourage that type of development for us. And even though we have access to all these different resources online, we, since we don't have a familiarity with the subject material before we learn it, like, it would just be adding to the teacher's job as sort of being a curator of the online world and bringing what is valuable into the classroom rather than us just wandering out into the web without knowledge of what we're supposed to be finding. So we become more like the tour guides than maybe the tour itself. On our educational journey. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I see technology as kind of like a backup plan. Like, I only watch like those type of videos like if I wasn't in class and like I missed it and I need to learn it on my own, you know? And, and like I was thinking that like you can only do that for certain subjects like where you can look at a YouTube video and understand something, for example, math. But I would say like for English, I know I go to Manette all the time and we have to have like an actual like conversation about it so that I can like grasp 
like like all the concepts that I need to and understand like what I'm trying to say. He can help me like understand what I'm only actually trying to say myself. And it's important to have like personal connections with teachers and I, th I appreciate you guys a lot. And I think that we definitely all, like will always need teachers, although like because they can teach us subjects, but they also teach us like valuable life lessons like beyond that. Um, it's also really important for teachers to keep the students focused on what we're supposed to be using the technology for. Because like if we have iPads in a class or in a history class, some kids will not be looking at stuff that has to do with history. And so that's a problem. And if teachers can like moderate what we're doing and encourage us to look at certain websites or like have a certain task for the day, that would be beneficial. I think this leads to great thoughts. And I, I can follow up with that a little bit. Um, I've seen this picture online. Most of the teacher friends I have favorite or like, I think, this picture. So it keeps coming up uh, on the internet whenever I log on into this internet. Uh, and it's a shoe holder where this brilliant teacher has put everyone's name on the shoe holder sleeve. And as you walk into the room, you're required to put your cell phone into the shoe holder, or else you will not be counted as present. Then we have another uh, side that says, we need to make sure that each school provides iPads or tablets for every student, and it should be in their hands all the time. What should we do? Take this from you or give this to you? What are thoughts about that? Um, I don't think it's necessary to have iPads like distributed to every single student, especially if we have like a cell phone in our pockets that we can just access whenever the teacher wants us to like, look something up or I can think like in Mrs. Erdeljack's class, we use like Kahoot to like do a bunch of like in-class activities to review, um, which I found to be very um, useful. But yeah, I don't think it's necessary to have a bunch of tablets if we have like the technology ourselves to like utilize the different types of resources. But at the same time, you still need to make sure people are on track, people aren't just like using um, their cell phones to like play games or you know, do stuff that's not focused on the material in class. And that whole concept of removing the phones entirely by putting them in there, it just seems like such a, such a stagnation of possibility because, I don't know, it's hard to look at it this way because it's not a tangible world, but the world of the internet is just a new place to discover, just like a new continent or a new physical space. It's a new space for us to go. And so cutting it off and avoiding it entirely can't be the answer because we'll grow up being people who don't know how to interact with that world otherwise. Like we need to learn in school, just like we're learning how to interact with our physical world to interact with our digital world. Um, another less like deep way of Maddie's little, <laughs> that was beautiful, but uh, another thing is just, we're going to have <laughs> our phones in our lives. Like they're going to be there. When we're doing our homework, we have them sitting next to us. When we're, you know, and we're out with our friends, they're in our pockets. And I think that learning how to deal with them being there as a distraction is a very important skill for our generation. I think that if we come into class and our teachers allow us to have them on our desk and don't really you know, care if we're using them or whatever, maybe we're using them for educational purposes, maybe we're not. And I think that learning that consequence of not using it for educational purposes, where maybe we didn't get the work done that we should have gotten done, and feeling the consequences of that is another important lesson that we're learning by having the technology there. Um, it's kind of similar to how like students get mad when they can't use a calculator in math classes. They're like, well, in real life, I'll have a calculator. You know, It's like that. Like In real life, we're going to have these phones here as a distraction. I think learning how to deal with them being there is a key part of having them with us. About that. So the idea that these natural consequences will come as a result of you using your phone. If you can't pay attention in class, there's certain things that you'll miss, and obviously that will hurt your performance in the class. Instead of the sort of top-down approach, we need to take this thing from you. I still don't know if I'm quite convinced, because once again, I'm talking to all the best students that we have in our school. So let me push this idea a little bit more. Really? Or am I really just talking to the best kids in the school? When you look at your peers, do you think the responsible thing is to make sure that all of you guys have screens? And, and you can say, yeah, or is that true? I don't know if it's like, I don't know. I, I, I haven't, I've seen it both ways. Like I've seen students from schools that have been provided with you know, iPads for everyone, and they love them, and they say it's the greatest. Like they always have their teachers can um, you know, count on every student having a way for them to access that assignment that was just you know, sent to them in the exact same format. Um, and I know Mr. Stengel gave the student class officers uh, either an iPad or a Chromebook to sort of pilot this to see how it worked for us throughout the year. 
Um, and I, say, I, I must say, I love having my Chromebook. Uh, I use it all day, uh, multiple times a day in my study hall, in my lunch, everything. And it's really nice to have that technology <clears throat> you know, in a very accessible way to me. And I think the other thing we need to understand also is that not everybody just has the technology. Like, it's easy, I don't know, to see all of us, or you know, we assume that everyone has an iPhone and everyone has you know, a, a personal laptop, but people don't. Like, that's just not the way it is. And I think that having everyone on an equal, equal playing field where you have the same, not only the same technology, you also just have technology, would be a really, I don't know, it's, amazing, it's an amazing thing to have happen in classrooms too, where we, like, every teacher can just assume that every student has access to the same thing and everything could get done. I don't know, it, it really, it kind of removes a lot of the worries about not using paper and things like that anymore because everyone has it in the same way and it's an equal playing field. Okay, um, let's move on to then a, a, a different question, more cultural, I guess. I, I will come back around to the educational use of it. But the, the worry in some adults, and I guess I share this worry a little bit, is that some of our social problems today aren't always fixed with technology, but sometimes the technology can lead to it. Maybe a declining morality, you say things that you wouldn't ordinarily say face to face over something like a text message. Maybe a decrease in work ethic because things can happen so fast now and I can get so much done and the copy and paste is there and then homework that would have taken you 45 minutes takes you four and a half minutes. Uh, motivation to get things done, critical thinking, maybe even attention span because you can't focus on things. We even heard a five minute YouTube clip may take too much of your life in order to focus on. Maybe even a drop in skills is things like spelling and grammar are done for you. Even forgetfulness because now I need to remind in real time Laura that she has homework due for today because she's forgotten that from earlier. Or is that not true? Is that just old people being old people or is there some truth to that? You know, we all hear from our parents all the time like how horrible technology is and how it's ruining culture and how it's the end of the world. But um, I saw this picture and it was basically, it was all these kids on their phones and it's like you, and it's supposed to be juxtaposing it to a picture from the 1920s. It's black and white and everyone instead of like being on their phones and being blocked off from everybody else, they're reading the newspaper. So I think it was, it's the same thing. It's not necessarily technology that's causing these problems. It's just a tool that humans are using to you perform the same behaviors that they always kind of have. Maybe it's a bigger cultural problem, but I don't think it's necessarily linked to technology completely. And I think I've seen a similar graphic where um, there's a group of people all looking at their phones and it's like, oh, they're doing nothing. They're just playing little games. And I always have my mom ask me that. What are you playing? What's that game on your phone? And way more often of the time, you're communicating with someone. You are sending a text message about a project or um, a lot of students, so you were saying some of the skills, you're worried about skills being degraded, spelling, grammar, that sort of thing. But you have to wonder, so something's taking the place of that. It's not just empty space in our minds. And because we are able to communicate so freely and openly online, I think students are becoming more critical thinkers because they have the means of expressing their opinions. Like, I don't know who's on Tumblr or I don't know the internet. Um, <laughs> But the ability to talk as equals with adults who have the same interests or to collaborate with their peers from across the world and have different perspectives, I think there are things taking the place of anything we might lose. Um, well then, let's say we're totally convinced now. Let's push for this technology. Uh, but can, is there a way to you to help separate for teachers like me and others from what's just a gimmick and what's something that's actually valuable? Um, you know, I, I can use music at the beginning that I've created myself using some type of musical app, and now you, I've engaged you, and okay, now let's learn about brain surgery or something. But is there a way that you guys can separate what's just a gimmicky thing and what's something that's actually valuable for learning? And if you wouldn't mind providing examples, you don't have to mention the teacher's names, but I'm sure that as we attempt to bring more technology in, sometimes it comes in more of the gimmicky form as opposed to something that's genuinely valuable to the lesson. So examples would be great because I think we're trying to figure out how to connect to you. So how do we separate those two? Well, I just wanted to expand on what you said, starting a presentation with music, that seems like a gimmick. Um, so the student hears that music and they don't just forget it. Like the student might think, oh, well, how can, how can I do that for my next PowerPoint? Because that was really cool. And then that same student is going to go to college and they're going to do a thesis like, oh, I remember music really helps me learn. How does that work? And then they're going to be a surgeon someday. And as the patient's falling asleep, they're going to be playing music and learning how that 
affect the psychology and treatment of patients. Like it's, it's so easy to brush that off when I think you're the one doing it and you think, oh, well, I'll add this and they won't really care and we'll get on with the lesson. But those things stick and we do think about them and it does. That's the thing that technology affords us is the ability to connect many different disciplines to improve any one subject. Maddie, quit giving such good answers. You're leaving nothing for the rest of the people to say. It's embarrassing, it's embarrassing. <laughs> but there's gotta be at least something out there that you knew, hey, great attempt. Um, one of the things that, that came around that I'll give the example is you could take a quiz by holding this thing in your hand through the screen instead of actually writing down the quiz. Instead, you could be, you push A instead of write A down. And a lot of us wondered, is that really beneficial to push A instead of write A down? beyond saving that little bit of paper, isn't it just a gimmick? Is it, is there, there, so th what I'm hearing is there's nothing that counts in your mind as just gimmicks. Everything that we attempt technological-wise would be useful? Um, I think, like the example that you just gave, um, <clears throat> things similar to that wouldn't really be as beneficial because say with the example of taking a quiz on your phone, I mean there could be issues like technologically with you know, the device you're using um, somebody could like accidentally like press a button. Like I think in situations like that, it would be much more reliable to use like paper and a pencil so you can, I don't know, like better just like express, like you know, if you're writing out like an answer to a question, it's just a better way to express that answer than to be using um, technology. Personally, whenever it comes to taking tests, I'm a full on, I need to write on paper. Like, I cannot take it online. Like, last year in APEX, um, we had this survey last year that said, like, would you take a unit test online? And I said, absolutely not. Because simply, I'm the type of person that if I don't know an answer, I like to just cross it off, come back to it. But if it was online, I would, like, I would forget which ones that I didn't do and which ones I did do, and I would get nervous that I didn't fill something out, or it would give me anxiety, you know? And I think I totally understand what Laura means, just because a lot of times in technology, it's clicking a button, like choosing an answer, but you need to like work things out in your mind. And actually, I know Mr. Stangle does this. He has his iPad with him like all day. He has this one app where he can write down notes and like, I mean, I'm sure you can doodle stuff. Like, I'm sure it's on his blog if you want to yeah, check it, it is. out. Yeah, check his blog out. Far from blogging. <laughs> um, but that's kind of why I think like iPads are really useful because you can write things down. And like, if so on some sort of test form or whatever, you have space to like get your thoughts out and figure it out. That would be beneficial. Like instead of just choosing a button, like Laura was saying. Yeah, using something instead of using like a Google form as they were talking about it before, where you just like go through the questions, then the, you, know, you click the button and A, B, C, D, E scrolls down and you click one of them. If you did have something that you could use interactively, like if it said like it saved your test more as like a, like a PDF or something like that where the teacher actually still scrolled through and was like, okay, I see this. You know, it's exactly the same as having a paper test. It would just be without the paper and that saves a lot of paper in the, like, you know, throughout the course of the day. So I think that we don't like having just like the A, B, C, D thing, but if we could still use a pencil you know, on, on our electronic test, that would make the difference. Which is one of the reasons it's so amazing for students to be able to have personal technology, whether it be a small laptop or an iPad, is that they can, they can learn how their own device works and tailor it to the exact technological and learning needs that they have. And especially, I think, with an iPad that you can hold and write on, and it still feels like that kind of traditional paper pen experience. And you said earlier, is it really worth it if we're just saving that little bit of paper? And I think it is, personally, as a budding environmentalist. But there are ways to... <laughs> There are ways to get around the benefits and still, or get around the risks of using technology and still reap the benefits. I think that leads into the next question, and I hope what you don't take from my questions is just skepticism. I think what we've heard so far is a lot of the worries that we have to embrace the technology are a little bit unfounded, and I, I sort of applaud that, but that doesn't mean that we can't still be skeptical about this. So an, another slightly skeptical thing, but maybe you could rewire my thinking on this, when I hear you talk about why can't I have that wonderful paper and pencil experience, I think it's a lot cheaper for just a paper and a pencil. Journals exist. You can get them in moleskin. Then you have that whole experience right there. But also in the, in the sessions we have um, upcoming Google Classroom and we have Google Community and we have Google Hangouts. And I know that you guys are young. 
but we had classrooms and communities and hangouts even before Google came around. To what extent are these virtual lives competing with actual lives? Do they work hand in hand and both get better because of that? Hanging out with your friends is better because you can hang out with them virtually. The classroom gets better because you also can virtually be in the classroom. Or is there this weird competition in where socialization and school maybe are taking a back seat, the, the actual real life to the virtual life? And is that a problem? It's a complex question, I guess. I don't think it's a problem because uh, it's the online, the virtual stuff is so accessible. Like, I can, I always have all my papers and my documents right on my computer, right on my iPad. Um, so it's just so much easier to learn that way whenever it's already at your fingertips. You don't really have an excuse anymore. You can't say, oh, I lost the homework if it's all right there. Um, and it, I think the part, what we're trying to find is the balance between the traditional classroom and the Google classroom because like some teachers are hesitant, but we know all about it. And so it's like working together and harmonizing like the best parts of each. Does that make sense? And I think that's a totally legitimate concern because they do compete. But I think what's important for us and for all of you to remember is that, you know, we're still human beings up here. We still like human connections. Like, even if we had the opportunity to be fully online, I took an online math class over the summer two years ago, and it was awful. You need other people around you, and we don't forget that just because we have technology. Like, we're fighting for it to be a supplement, but I don't think anyone up here would rather have it replace their personal communication. That's why we're all here instead of like Skyping in on a screen. We like to be around people. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Go people. Uh, another thing, and just as a teacher, I know that this is another risk that comes in with us looking at technology. You guys mentioned the end drive. There's probably a list of things that I could mention before this that I feel like there's been an awful lot of investment of time in teacher time where we're trying to learn our lessons and plan our lessons and know our students and talk to students and look at uh, college essays and write letters of recommendation to then invest the time to learn a new technology that you have a sense may be useless in the future. Can you either make me feel better about that investment or can you suggest um, technologies that you know are worth the investment? You mentioned the Google Drive and you mentioned that's something that's worth it to learn to put your time into. Or make me feel better about that. Because what if I walk out of here and say, come on, I get to really learn three hours Google community, and next year it may not even be here. We, we saw that in the PowerPoint. Why did you learn how to use the TV after the radio if the internet was going to come anyways? Well, yeah. what a good point. <laughs> it's part of that never being afraid to take action. Because we don't know what comes next, but we can't afford to always be waiting for the next best thing. And yeah. just like you guys are learning all the new technology, so are we. And it's just part of the new human experience that we're all sharing, is that we're always trying to keep up with technology and the things that we are creating. And it is much faster than it, I, it's, I think it's feeling faster now, but we can do it. <laughs> I believe in us. <laughs> is there anything, again, that's, that's we're being very um, general, and I think it's great. We're being optimistic. but. Going back with just a good feeling in my heart doesn't actually sit me down in front of a computer to make a lesson for tomorrow. What, what should I spend my time on? Where should I put my effort today to change my classroom for the better for tomorrow? What's the thing? I'm sure you've seen lots of different teachers do this. Um, what could I do tomorrow that would make my class more engaging technologically that would be worthwhile? Uh, and, I, and I could agree with that. Well, I, for most of us, we don't have personal experience with Google Apps for Education because we're just not in that world. I can say I'm Mrs. Bigor, the journalism teacher uses the community. And what that is, you can go to that community and there are all these tabs. Everything you need to know for that class, all the grammar, the style, when stories are due, how to write a story even, it's all there. And so just having that space online where a student can go and just like live in that classroom type of space is really helpful. But uh, for different apps, we're not exactly sure specifically what apps we would want to bring into the classroom. But any technology that could connect students with teachers and connect students with students um, and make learning a more active um, process for students. 
like Sarah was talking about, I think it's just important for teachers to have a balance of technology. Like you need to be able to have resources available so a student can go home, access a bunch of material, say from the lecture in class today so they can better understand the concept. But it's also important to be there in class, to be really teaching the material, making sure everyone's grasping it, understanding it, making sure you're tending to everyone's different um, like learning styles, you know, different ways that people understand information, just making sure um, you're kind of like adapting to the different types of students, basically, I think. And this isn't, I don't think, a super satisfying answer, but really the first thing you should do if you want to have a more technologically innovative classroom is to ask your students, because we're a very small sampling. We haven't had all of your classes, and really every single class is different in what you can and are able to put online. So yeah, talk to your students. They're fun. We know a lot of them. <laughs> This next question is a little bit risky, and there's a chance we won't be able to come up with something, but I'll still give it a shot. I'm in beta mode here, and failures are just part of it. What I just asked about was the idea of maybe tonight I can go and I can make my classroom better incrementally. I can do just this little bit of change and engage more students, connect to. But if you really looked at a vision of 20 years from now, 30 years from now, your own children, if you can even imagine something as preposterous as that, right, going to school here, what are the moonshot ideas if we completely revamp education to engage you absolutely most, not what we have and then change it just slightly, but throw the whole playbook out, start education from scratch. Is there some idea or some way that you can envision that looking that maybe we could work towards to set this goal as we saw and then work towards it, figure out how the heck we're going to get there? Well, the absolute first thing that comes to my mind is there would be no textbooks. Um, and we even have textbooks it's now. It's that, that paper thing, right? right? Exactly. It's really well, a hang We have up, a yeah. classroom set, we have a home set, and I don't carry them back and forth ever. Um, but if you look up any textbook title and PDF, the first thing that comes up is a full PDF of your textbook. And I'm sure that's illegal, but it exists. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I think, I think the physical textbook is on its way out. And in 20 years, it'll be gone. Okay, but like the thing for me is that like I don't want that to be out because personally, like I hate, sorry, cut shut. I hate having the math book textbook online. I need it out of my house. It's so frustrating because for me, like I do need to do things on, um, uh, like on paper. But if I feel like if we incorporated what Stangles, Mr. Uh, Mr. Stangles, doing with his like iPad and having like taking notes on um, that, like t he takes a picture of whatever piece of paper and then gives it back to them and then writes on that paper at like in the picture. Or, yeah, I think that's what he does. And I think that that's something that we could work towards, but like I still need to see like the like physical paper at some point. Even if it's just one. Like there are certain things that I think like paper is important to have. Like so wait that's things. That's a question even for us up here that we should be thinking about, that in 20 years when our kids are coming to the school, will they still have that desire to have a physical textbook? Or by that point, you know, because the only reason we have that desire is because we've grown up with it, that we've yeah. grown up using textbooks and writing things down. But will that desire even still exist? Um, I think that with technology, like you're saying, you can pull up like a PDF of a textbook online. but It's so easy to get distracted while you're using technology. It's so easy to just like venture off and like go online to different websites, but with like a physical textbook, um, I, I feel like it's more, I mean, I find it personally more easy for me to focus if there's like, you know, a textbook in front of me. And I mean, you could still easily get distracted with like something else that's like your phone sitting right next to you, but I think it just kind of goes back to people's different um, like opinions in different ways that they prefer to learn because some people really like to write information down as a way of like better understanding it, better learning it, like if you write it down, rather than just like reading it online. So, yeah. So. But, okay, so before we had textbooks, then before we had textbooks, it was just someone learning in a classroom. And so when they decided to put information in textbooks and send them home, I'm sure there was someone saying, well, that's dumb. You could easily just open another book and read that instead. Like, just because it's easy doesn't mean we'll do it. We still have the drive to learn information and complete assignments. So I think even if it's easy to do something else, we have the self-control not to. So I think the debate about whether textbooks exist in physical form or online form will be a part of our future. But is there anything else as we, as we change education? Is, 
you, and I'm sure you've had to have discussions with your friends. You know, if I was running that school, you wouldn't sound like that. You know, if I was running that school, I would decide to do this. I would throw this entire thing. I would get rid of this whole thing. I would, I would change education because we're not learning in this way. Don't they realize that we should learn this way? I'm the they. I, they're the they. We want to know what that is. I know education reformers tend to cite the Scandinavian countries and their schooling systems as kind of the ideal or the next step to the ideal. And it's um, this idea of eliminating the traditional classroom and the traditional classroom dynamic and kind of eliminating the um, student and then there's the teacher and making it a community of learners so that we can all engage together rather than what feels like we're sitting here absorbing, absorbing information as they give it to us. Another thing that I think that uh, I find that myself and my peers are become frustrated with often is the idea of busy work. And I know teachers are always like, I'm removing busy work. Everything you do is, you know, I promise it won't be busy work. It will all be necessary. And <clears throat> to a point, I think that that's true. Um, but I think there's still a lack of, like, you need to do the work to understand the, the material in the class. But there's still a disconnect between, like, why the understanding of that material is important and why learning that in general isn't just busy work. I think that in an ideal classroom there really would be like like that great connection to why it really matters. Like a lot of people think like I'm not, I'm going to I want to be an English teacher, so why do I have to take calculus? And it's like and people get mad at that all the time like why am I required to take this class? And I think that finding the ideal education would be somehow finding that great connection to why it really does matter and not learning things that appear to be unnecessary. I think with the addition of technology, we're going to have to redefine how we see the school, not only just as in, like, an educational concept, but the physical building. Um, because right now, like, this is where we come to learn. It's an end point. But I think 20 years from now, the school is where you're going to come to utilize technology that you don't necessarily have at home, a way where you as a class will, like, conference call another class in Mumbai. Like, it's, it's not going to be... Going from your home to the school isn't going to be the journey. It's going from your home to your school to be able to connect with everywhere else. Um, I think we'll ask one more question. You guys have been fantastic, by the way. And this one certainly has an English teacher bent to it a little bit. But we talked, at least I heard Mr. Stengel suggest that you guys, when we track it, may look at up to eight different screens a day during the school time. And then when you go home, I imagine that that number is similar between your phone and your tablet and your, and your TV and other things. There was a, a writer, 1953, Ray Bradbury, who suggested something like this would happen, that our culture would become just addicted to screens and the idea that now teachers can send out information that you may be required to look at at 7.30 at night, 8.30 at night to catch up with this. Will you ever get a chance to unplug? And are you worried about that? Make me feel better. <laughs> that we're not becoming exactly this great risk as we disappear into thoughtlessness, lack of concern, because information hits us. Screens are around us, but that doesn't mean that we're ever able to process it. In Fahrenheit 451, what they saw on the screen was just like useless. Like the, I forget what the girl's name or the lady's name was, but she just Maurice. stared. What? Mildred. She just stared at this screen. It was just chatter, basically. But what we see on the screen, it's useful, and it applies to our lives, like between apps that have to do with news or history or different cultures, anything. Like, it applies to us, and we use that information to, like, go forward and do something about it. So I just don't, I don't think it's as scary as adults sometimes think it is. And, like, we're not, our minds aren't just being... Um, what's the word, like washed away. Like we're still people and we still want to learn. It's just a different method of getting there than you guys are used to. Right, I think we're experiencing a shift in what we define as intelligence because before we had access to the web, um, intelligence was knowing a lot of facts and knowing a lot of stuff about a lot of different things. And I have described my knowledge, like going into college interviews and stuff, like what are we gonna talk about? I have surface level knowledge of a broad variety of things. <laughs> um, and so intelligence now, it's not just knowing things because everybody has access to the same information. It's how do we interpret and apply those things. And that's, you know, in all the space and the time where we're not memorizing facts, we have the space and the time to think, okay, what do I do with them? 
I spent three weeks this summer um, on an hour bound trip. So it, we were in the middle of the Oregon wilderness with no phones, and it was just 10 kids, and we had no, nothing you know, technological at all. And I think we all agreed that we found ourselves still needing, we, we still leave the group and like need time to decompress as we would if we had our phones. So the phone was not, the technology was not the determining factor if we were you know, engaging in these social relationships. It was just our own personal um, incentive to do so. Well, I think that we've reached the end of our time, so I'd like to uh, give our group of students a round of applause. Well, I'd also, yes, please, uh, go ahead, Maddie. And if you'd like to hear us say some more stuff about technology, stop by room 304. Yeah, I, I think in one incarnation this morning, we imagined that you guys would ask questions of the group up here, and then they would try to yell back, but it's probably better to do that in a slightly more intimate setting, although I can't imagine a more intimate setting than what we have here, again, with the furniture and arrangements here. Yeah. But what, what room is that, Mr. Stengel? 304. 304, if you're interested uh, in the science wing, which I, maybe Marnik's room? I think an invasion of Marnix. Yeah. Marnix. It's around Marnix room. Uh, look Between for the students. Between 302 and 306. Yeah. <laughs> so one more round of applause, please. I, I was in, I was in rapture. Um, quick personal privilege story. When I was about uh, these students' age, my parents asked me to brown some meat, and I proceeded to blacken the meat, uh, and it was never edible again. And they never asked me to brown the meat again. Uh, and it became a euphemism in my, in my household to blacken the meat is to purposely mess it up so bad you never get to do it again. But I think Mr. Minette has actually done the exact opposite of blackening the meat, and I'm going to be recruiting him for every panel I ever that do. That was my so intention. Maybe a round of applause for Mr. Minette, please. Okay, so uh, we have given you 13 minutes to get to your class. The students wanted to give you six Six minutes, because that's all they have to get to their class. Is it five? Sorry. So I should hold you for eight minutes just to see what they have to do every day.